Hey, everybody. Welcome into another episode of Catching Feelings with John Sapinaro. Of course, I am John Sapinaro. I'm the host. I'll be taking you through the next 45 minutes or so alongside an amazing guest as we talk about all things Mets related uh, here on my channel on Facebook and as well as the QBT channels on Facebook and on Twitter. So wherever you're tuning in, keep those comments coming in uh, during the live stream. We want to hear from you. Um, it's been an eventful week if you're a Mets fan. It's been kind of crazy. Things started out with just getting taken the task by the Boston Red Sox starting pitching, which at this point has been held together with wishes and duct tape. I don't even understand how the Mets didn't score off this starting staff. I know some of those guys had good days and you tip your cap, but you know, you can't waste the kind of outings that the Mets wasted over the past week. And then this series in Philadelphia was everything that you could expect from a Mets Philly series in Philadelphia. There was animosity. There was almost punches being thrown. There was heartbreaking losses. And then it brings us to what happened last night on Sunday night baseball. It is a game that in the last five years in the last 10 years, the Mets would be on the losing end of for sure. 100% of the time they would have been on the losing end of that. They would have been on the losing end of the call with Reese Hoskins, that home run that would have been called a home run, or it would have just barely gone out they would have been on the losing end of a play like what Jonathan VR was able to do where he took that extra base he was daring he was bold but he was savvy he was smart in the moment those plays always go against the Mets but it was messy getting there was messy they brought in Diaz with the four run lead when he said after the game that he had a stiff back. So now you're wondering why bring Diaz into a game. That's not a safe situation when he's not hundred percent that's on the manager. And then we have the legend of Donnie Stevenson, this made up character, the approach coach that I think is, is probably Pete Alonzo's brainchild. It sounds like it's a Pete Alonzo kind of thing. Um, I don't know if that's where it comes from. Hopefully Donnie sticks around because when Donnie's here, the Mets hit and the Mets put up runs. And ultimately that's what we're going to lean into the fact that the Mets took two out of three from the Phillies. They got back to 500. It was messy, but they did it. And here we are. So now I'm going to bring in my guest. He's a fantastic Mets fan. He's also a fantastic comedian. You may have seen him on MTV, on Comedy Central. He's been on the Food Network. He's been in the New York City comedy scene forever. He's hilarious. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome on Mark Anthony Ramirez. Mark, what's going on, man? Hey, what's up? How are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. So let's let's just start right there. Let's start with, with Donnie Stevenson. How are you feeling about this new approach coach that the Mets have? <laughs> uh, I personally love Donnie. I've worked with him myself on my softball swing. And, you know, he just really breaks it down for you on how to approach. And he helped me work on my leg kick and my timing and where to keep my hands. I think this is great. It's, it echoes, you know, like the 85, 86 Mets when you had uh, the whole Sid Finch story. Mm -hmm. And I think it's things like this that help create like a bonding thing with the team. And I think that's what you're seeing here. And, 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 and whether Alonzo created it, Whoever came up with it, I think it's fantastic. And man, let's go Mets with that. I mean, hey, if I, let's bring Santa Claus on board. Let's get a unicorn named Tippy. Like whatever we need to keep hitting, because that's all we needed. We've needed hits. Poor, you saw what happened to Degrom. You know what I mean? It was just uh, you kind of feel bad for Degrom. You almost want to give him like a lucky rabbit's foot or something <laughs> like, you know, it, it's just weird. Like he, he's pitching and he's, he's averaging nearly a hundred miles. It's like, how much harder does this man have to throw for the, for him to win? He's probably, that's where all that energy comes from to, to manage a hundred plus mile an hour fastballs. It's just pure. Like these sons of bitches better <laughs> give me a hit, you know? That's true. I mean, it's, it's how much harder does he have to work? to to get wins how much harder does he have to work to execute because he he's doing everything he possibly can and degrom's been a topic of conversation you know we started i started doing this show right when the season opened and obviously he's been a topic on every single episode because he's been great but the mets have not been great for him and unfortunately that's been the case the last four or five years that you know and he's never going to reach the win plateaus but i don't I, fortunately for him i don't think it matters you know i think he wants the team to win and i think he realizes that the wins for him and his personal legacy and his Hall of Fame candidacy aren't going to matter because the win has been so devalued and mostly by the Mets offense. <laughs> oh, he's going to absolutely by the Mets offense, but he's definitely going to be a product of his time. You know, I think you're going to see guys with much lower uh, win numbers and certain stats that we'd become accustomed to 
previously uh, to denote what a Hall of Famer is are going to be completely wiped out by, you know, this, um, by the way, baseball is looked at today, uh, mostly by the numbers, you know, the over analysis of the game, so to speak. I, I think it's overanalyzed, you know, and I think uh, like uh, and, I, and the thing is, what's odd about that is whenever you say that people just get kind of angry. It, it has created this this like faction of people that are like, oh, but the numbers and it's, you know, the game has changed in, in some ways. I think the changes have been great. In other ways, I'm kind of like mm, he could have pitched a little bit longer, you know? Yeah. You know, but it's it's honestly the Grom is just in another is on another planet right now. Garrett Coles is pitching on a, a on a he's pitching on a moon that circles the Grom's planet. I'll put it that way. <laughs> Like That's this. a great way to put it for, for some of the Yankee fans that may be watching. Uh, a comic that we both know, uh, uh, Andrew Bayroff chiming in with some really hard-hitting analysis in the chat. He says, sports! <laughs> 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 Which I really appreciate. What up, Andrew? Thanks for tuning in. And then he said he said something that's actually, actually very true. I don't know if he lucked into this comment, but he said, it's all about the RBIs, man. And it really is. For the yeah. Mets this year, it has been all about the RBIs right. or, or really the lack thereof. Right. Because their inability to hit with runners in scoring position, it, it blows my mind. It's unlike anything that I've ever seen before. And I, I last year when it happened, I was willing to write it off. This, everything about the season was so strange. They started, they stopped, they went to summer camp. You know, those sample sizes were so difficult to judge. So when you look at it in that context, I was like, ah, it doesn't matter. They're, they're too yeah. good. This is, this is going to work out. But now when you look at it, it's carried over. Mark, what do, what do you think this says about the team? Cause they're better than this. Their offensive players should be better than this. Here's the thing. You have some really talented bats on this team. You know, uh, here's my issue. I do uh, like, I like, I like uh, Davis as a, as a batting coach. Cause he knows the game. He knows, he knows what works to a certain degree. I think the problem with baseball right now, and, and this is to me something that it's approach. I think, you know, uh, power has become a, a major, propo- like a, a major aspect of the game and walks and people rather walk than actually just swing the bat, which mm-hmm. is kind of like why I like McNeil's kind of like old school approach. Like, look, I'm either getting a hit or I'm not getting anything and I'm going to swing at everything I think I can hit. Yeah. But, and I think like, if you look at um, teams from like the seventies and eighties, you know, you had more slap hitters on a team. You know, guys that just move, you know, or station to station or would get on base like a backman or whatever, or even nails before he decided doing the roids. But it's it's <laughs> kind of like you I think you need to see more of a like Nimmo. You see a guy like Nimmo, he walks a lot. That's great. You're on base. But it, it's there's something about literally getting a hit that I feel is as a guy who pitched is more detrimental to the psyche of a pitcher that you're facing then, all right, you know, whatever, I, I walk the guy. I'll just keep throwing because the next guy is going to swing. Because if I if that pitch is an inch closer to the corner, I know next batter I can strike him out because he's just going to sit there and wait. And I think that's something that you see throughout baseball is you see a lot of guys trying to take that walk instead of trying to take that pitch the opposite way. Yeah, no, it, it's a really good point. It's a good point that you brought up uh... – uh, Nimmo specifically, because a big knock on Nimmo early was that he was always looking to walk, even in situations where he should look to hit. And so, right. yeah, he's got a great eye at the plate, but you know what? The great eye only translates if you're also ready to hit all the time. So when you're 2 0 and the guy throws a ball down the middle, it's to nobody's benefit to take that pitch just because you want to see more pitches, maybe leading off a game. Sure. We can argue the merits right. there. You want to get the guy, you know, you want to kind of set the tone of, of the game for your offense, but you know, three, one, two, Oh, you know, hitters counts things where you should be looking for a fastball. And to his credit, he has adapted because he does go into attack mode. Now it's also something uh, not Mets related, but that a lot of people criticize Joey Votto. A lot of times yeah. every year, Joey Votto would lead the league in on base percentage, but it's like, right. Hey man, you're the only guy in this offense. You've got a 10 year contract with the reds. You know, they don't invest in, in players often. They invested in you. You've got to be the guy to draw, to knock in the runs. You can't be like, oh, I'm going to take my walks and pass it on. You got to be yeah. a little bit more aggressive. And, 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 and I, I, I yeah, go ahead. No, I apologize, but I just I feel that's the thing. I don't feel like players are aggressive, especially like when they're at the plate. I think you need to be more aggressive, especially when you got runners in scoring position. The other thing I think that we should see more of is in in Barry Bonds said this years ago. I know steroids, but I will give Barry this. Barry would choke up a little bit so he'd get more back control. Mm -hmm. And I think Barry hit more uh, choked up home runs than anybody in Major League history. Yeah, I just think that you know what. 
focusing more on your back control in those situations. And, and I mean, you got like how many times last week did Dom get up with like men on second or Lonzo got up with men on second? You know, it's like if you if you're if you focus on with the with these guys, natural power, if you focus on that line drive or even that bloop single, you're going to you're going to do more for your team and keep them more in the game than if you get that two run home run. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely an approach issue for sure. I I totally agree with you on that because, you know, you see it with some of the other players. And and we can joke about Donnie Stevenson. As a matter of fact, uh, Keith Blacknick, uh, who's behind the scenes here uh, at the QBC, he says, Chili Davis is to be replaced by Donnie Stevenson. I think that might be where <laughs> we're going. Um, but, you know, P- Pete Alonso joked about how – you know, they, they were, they were uh, trying to hit fastballs. That was the thing, right? It was like seeking the heaters or whatever he said in the, in the post game. And it's like, that's what you have to do. You have to be able, your eye at the plate is only as good as being able to execute on pitches in the zone that you can hit. And yeah, the Mets have struggled in a lot of situations where they will take a pitch for a strike right down the middle. And this is team wide. Smith has done it. Alonzo's done it. McNeil has done it to a lesser extent because he's pretty aggressive, but they'll take a pitch right down the middle for a strike. And then they'll swing at the pitcher's pitch, the curveball. They'll swing the at the sliders. change up on the They black. swing at a lot of sliders, man. If you watch them, if you watch video of the last three weeks of the Mets, man, a lot of sliders out, out, outside corner down mm-hmm. and in just it's just awful the sliders eat them up and i think the the other issue like it's it's like some a member of an old batting coach used to tell me because i sucked i couldn't hit breaking pitches for crap fastballs <laughs> i'd sit on that but it, and he would tell me he was like all right i get it you want to he was like you have to think fastball and adjust to the rest he was like but the league is you know our, our little bullshit league they were like they're eating you up with breaking pitches so think breaking pitch first for a little while and then and you know if you if you if you think that a fastball is coming prepare for it and man, I went on a little bit of a tear and then people stopped throwing me breaking balls for a little bit. You know, it's it's making adjustments. And I think that's why if you actually look at McNeil's numbers, his hard hit numbers, McNeil's just been a little unlucky in certain mm-hmm. regards because he's been hitting the ball. He's been stinging it. He's just been stinging it right at people. And the same thing is it can be same with Lindor. He's been hitting, but he's hitting it right at people. And, and that's just that just comes down to luck at this point and they're going to get lucky. I mean, you got, you've got a team of guys who can, who can hit, hit with authority. And if they just focus on moving batter, you know, moving, moving runners, they're going to score like plenty of runs. Like you saw what happened last night. You know, it's just, it's bound to happen. Thank you, Donnie. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you, Donnie. And Donnie, we trust. Um, No, your point on McNeil is actually spot on. I mean, his, his batting average on balls in play was way down. He was hitting the ball hard. So he was, he was really just hitting into some hard luck. And I agree with you fully on Lindor with the exception of maybe last night, last night, he had some weak swings on some bad pitches. I think last night is probably the worst he's looked. And I'm really happy Mm -hmm. that they're, they've got another series on the road for him to get right. Because if they were coming home tonight, I think that Lindor it was probably, and I tweeted it last night. He he's got guy who needs a day off written all over him. Oh, yeah. Just the guy who needs to not be in the lineup. You know, VR can play shortstop. Um, you know, he's not as good as Lindor, obviously, but he's hitting well. He's a spark plug. He brings some different elements. And I think I would sit him tonight. I haven't seen the lineup, but uh, I would sit him tonight or, or definitely if he has another bad game, I, I'd give him one of these games off to just get his oh, yeah. head right, man. He seems like he's pressing now, whereas early on it seemed like it was a little bit more bad luck. Well, it's funny. You know what I do love about Lindor, though? And if you've noticed throughout this whole this rough start, is his defense never suffers and that smile really never goes away. He's getting booed. He's like, all right, guys, I get it. I'm playing, you know, my bat is really bad right now. But did you see what I just did in the field? Like the guy, his heart is all into it. He really loves playing. And defensively, I mean, he's already put out like five gems that you're just kind of like, wow, we really needed this guy up the middle. He's making our pitching staff even better. You know, yeah, and I think that's I totally what's important. There. Absolutely. He hasn't let it affect him in the field. I mean, he had that one bad game in Chicago where nobody wanted to play. It was the worst defensive game I've seen out of the Mets in a long time. And they have gotten better in that regard. So, um, I agree with you. And, and he's he's still there pumping up his teammates. He's still there answering the questions. Absolutely. He's still being the same Francisco Lindor. It's just the the, the offensive results aren't there, which I, they're going to come. They're, they, right. they have to. You know, people are, are not taking into account, enough people aren't taking into account that he changed leagues. He's in a new division. 
He's with new people in a new city and you factor in the pressure of signing that big deal. And, you know, there's, there's going to be an adjustment both mentally, Absolutely. emotionally, not only physically. So I, I right. think Lindor will come around, but I still think, you know, especially if he plays today and he has another stinker, he might need a day off. Right. And, and the other thing is, it's kind of like uh, that day off will help him. I think he just give him a break. And, 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 and the other aspect I like about, what's going on with the Mets is, and I wanted to point this out because he deserves his flowers. Have you noticed Pete Alonzo's defense so far this season? Have, Have you? Been he's, he's been like, you know what? I know everybody, you know, Dom's a more natural first baseman than I am. I know I've got the body of a DH at 40, but I'm going <laughs> to do this and I'm going to, I'm going to rock this. And he has been, man, his, his stretching, his dives, he's timing dives better. He's, he soft hands. He's really impressed me this year with his defense. I thought that was going to be the thing that, you know, either forced him to be traded to an American league team, or I was praying for us to get a DH in our league, which I hate, but it, Pete's proven. Guess what? He's a nifty first baseman. You better watch out. He's going to scoop those balls up. Yeah. And, and it's, it's to his credit, it's something that he's said since his first year in the league that he wanted to be better at first. He didn't want to be a liability. And, you know, last year, I think it was more about the fact that it was a sprint and it was 60 yeah. games where, you know, you did have the DH as a fail safe and, you know, Pete wasn't hitting great anyway. He was falling into a lot of bad habits. So you saw Dom Smith and Dom had such a great year that people wanted to elevate him. I think right. when I heard people talking about trading one of them, I just think that's a that's just a bad idea, man. Because look, the DH is coming more than likely next year. There will be a DH, and so that'll work itself out. But even if it doesn't, man, you know, Dom, since he identified the sleep apnea issues, he's been a lot more athletic. He's been a lot leaner. He's been a lot fitter. And so, is he ever he's a whole different goal? athlete? Yeah, is he going to be a Gold Glove left fielder? Probably no. not. But he but hasn't be a really solid called left us. fielder. He hasn't. Absolutely. Right, he hasn't hurt the team. And that's the thing that kills me about these people that that lose their mind with Dom and left. I'm like, of the three outfield positions at City Field, left is not that hard to handle. But it's also the fact that he, with a little bit of coaching and in, in, in game, you know, adjustments to you know his positioning, he's he's not a bad left fielder. I've seen I've seen a lot worse, man. And and he's. He's doing a solid job up there. Keep his bat in the lineup. I think you yeah. got to I, I think I think the one thing that the Mets have to do a little differently is let their lefties hit lefties cuz Dom has shown that he can do it. Conforto last year showed that he can do it. If you leave him in there to face these lefties, they're going to hit him. I, I agree with you there. I think, um, ironically enough, I think Nimmo has shown the least ability to adjust to lefties yes. over the course of his career. But even this year, I mean, he, when he's been healthy, he's hit lefties. He's done pretty well, and they've they've rewarded him by keeping him in there longer. Speaking speaking of lefties, we, we can't we can't talk about lefty pitchers without mentioning um, Jose Alvarado, who uh, you know threw at Conforto and had that dust up with Dom Smith on Friday night, yeah. and then you know he. He appeals the suspension and then winds up giving up three runs last night, which that's is a, a, another thing that would break against the Mets uh, normally oh, yeah. in years past, right? You got a guy that's like, no, I'm staying in until this is sorted out. And then the guy, oh, yeah. you know, winds up giving up a bunch of runs. But what, what was your feeling on that? Because Ron Darling, who is usually the most buttoned down of the 86 Mets, but you know, he's got it in him. Right. And I tweeted that too, during the game. Yeah. It's like, wow, Ron's 86 is showing. He was like, you got to go get this man. He invited yeah. you out there. You got to go get him. So as, as somebody who was a big fan of the 86 team, I mean, what, what Alvaro did was, was way, way out of proportion. He got knocked out. Ray Knight would have <laughs> ran up there and punched him in the face. Like, <laughs> and I, and, and here's the thing, like, look, I grew up playing and pitching in the town and I threw, I threw gas. I threw it my own father. Like <laughs> I was raised, you throw it people that, that are, you know, you throw it guys who are being smart asses, smirking, winking, whatever asshole or jerk like behavior. And he deserved it. And, and I love that Dom stood up for the team and stood up for his teammates and was like, man, if you want to go, let's go. And that's what you need. I think this team, what you're going to see happen to this team with the Donnie Stevenson situation. With, with with this little thing with Alvarado, you're going to see this team start to bond, mm -hmm. which is what you saw at the 86 Mets. You know, and, and they started bonding in 85 and in 84, but it's like they really bonded like towards the end of 85 when they were, were battling out St. Louis for that final playoff spot. 
And, you know, they missed it and they were very frustrated that offseason and they bonded. And those crazy cokeheads, they won in 86, obviously. And, and, and for all his button upness, you know, Ron Darling was a freak back in the 80s. He was like the <laughs> cutest Met. He, had a, he was a lady killer. Everybody knows he was a lady killer. So it's just kind of like, come on, you know, Don, like he plays this role like uh, I'm the statesman of the 86 Mets and I'm. And yeah, you went to an Ivy League college. Come on, Donnie, you had, you know, he, Ron had freak face. And he was a dude that had all, had all the chicks back in the day. You know, he was, you know, because he's such a well-educated guy. And he's a brilliant guy, actually. I got to speak to him one time. And he's a wonderful guy. But it, come on. You know, they were all, that was a wild group of guys. And I think what you're seeing with this Met team is that they're going to slowly bond over these first two months. And I think they're a team to watch going, I, I say, from June 15th on. The rest of the league will have something to worry about with this team, to be really honest with you. I think so too. And it's one of those things I, I don't like to, to, you know, bring up the same topics that we've spoken about before, uh, especially as they become older news, but you know, the Mets inability to play games early in the season with the COVID and the snow out and the right. rain out, um, all of those things played such a large factor. And, you know, they, especially offensively, they weren't able to get into the kind of rhythms that baseball players need to get into, especially early in the right. season. And with that, here we are looking back, they're 500. They haven't even begun to click as an offensive team, and they're 500. And they're Nobody right there. Has gotten hot yet. That's yeah. the scary thing. Not what we were talking about this before we started, but you know, hitting is contagious. Mm -hmm. You know, and 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 nobody's gotten hot yet. Once one of those guys gets hot, I I really do feel sorry for the National League East. I, I do. Because if that offense gets hot and they're averaging five runs, if that if that team, if that offense averaged four runs a game. It's over for the rest of the league. I really, I. It's kind of like what our pitching right now. It's it's kind of over. We have guys, even the guys that we have in our in, on, at the alternative site are decent. You know, like four and five pitchers. You know, on a on a starting staff. Like Lucchese got called up today. That guy's he's a decent five. You know, he's a better five than we've had previously. Yeah, we well, we have years. real depth, and that's something that we've right. talked about on the show a lot. The Steve Cohen era um, really invites a lot of things, and you, you you always look at the big thing. You look at the fact that like the Wilpon Mets would have never been able to trade for and sign Lindor. It would have never happened. No. That's the big one. That's the flashy one. But when you look at a bench that has Jonathan VR and Kevin Pillar and Albert Armora Jr. And you look at, you know, a starting rotation that has depth like Lucchese and Jordan Yamamoto and these guys that are down on the alternate site. Eventually, David Peterson, he's going to have right. to fight for his spot because we've got Carrasco and Syndergaard coming back. And you you look at the way they were able to spread money around and really build depth. That's, the, for me, the biggest part of the Steve Cohen regime so far has been the fact that where they can put the money in other places that aren't just the flashy places. And Building think, up the analytics department, you know, right. the Mets had the worst one in baseball. Now they have, you know, one of the most comprehensive or they're on their way there. That's the Steve Cohen effect that we really see. And I think the other thing that's kind of scary when you want to think about Mets pitching is you're getting back two high level starting pitchers who are completely different style pitchers. Mm -hmm. You know, Carrasco, he could still get, you know, he, he's got a little velo on the ball, but he's, he's a movement guy and he's a guy who knows how to pitch and he's a control guy. With, with still a little with enough gas left that he gets you know he, he he gets enough strikeouts, and then you bring in back a guy who's got who after the elbow he still he hasn't even let loose yet and he's already hitting ninety seven, mm -hmm. you know and and when and when he's on when Thor when Thor is on, <laughs> he, um you know and when he now that he's left the rest of the MCU alone and he's back to pitching, he is gonna be I think a guy that's gonna come in and give the Mets a solid 10 wins in the second half and people are gonna be shocked and, and I know we have to baby him a bit because he's coming back from elbow surgery but he's a guy with the with a body type and the the length of frame man it's gonna be scary the second half this team could truly dominate the league. I agree with you there. And I'm actually going to bring up a, a comment that is a fantastic one. Also from Keith Blacknick, uh, based on what you said, he said, put Syndergaard in the pen. Now he's not a huge Syndergaard fan, Keith. He, he, he doesn't <laughs> love him, but I actually think it makes sense here based on what you said, because they are going to have to handle Syndergaard 
a little right. different. They are going to have to manage his innings. They are going to have to be careful there. And I think he's a guy that when he comes back, he's going to be in the rotation. But because they have Peterson, because they have Yamamoto, because they have Lucchese, they have this depth. When Syndergaard starts to reach that threshold, he's the kind of pitcher you could say, you know what, man? We're going into a pennant run. It's August. It's September. Okay, We're you put him in the pen. bullpen. Yeah, so you agree with that? Just let I, him be a fireball the out of the pen? I think, I think you let him come in and start 10 games, maybe maybe 12 games, which he might be – he could probably get more starts than that, but I think either you start him in the pen from the beginning or you end him in the pen as, as we enter the playoffs. Either, either one of those would work, but I really would love to see them – because we all saw what happened with Harvey, sadly. Mm-hmm. And I, I think if you, if, you, if you start him off and you're going to make him a starter, great – you know, get it. You know, get as many starts out as you can, but keep get leave him like forty innings to do relief work into the playoffs. Because it, it's kind of like again reminds me of '86. We had Aguilera in in the pen, and if you look at what Aguilera achieved out of the pen during the World Series and the playoffs, it's fantastic. Yeah, no, it, it, there's a there's definitely a. Um a point to be made about letting Syndergaard throw quality innings out of the pen for sure. So I know Keith was going to say that anyway, cause he don't love him. but I think <laughs> at this point he, he, does, he just, he thinks he's a little bit too much of a diva, but that's a whole, that's a whole nother conversation. I'm going to give you, I, I, I will give you I, I, another person I met with Syndergaard and we had a nice conversation at a bar at one time <laughs> in, in the, in the uh, iron district or whatever that is. He and I had a nice conversation, but the one thing I've noticed that he's done is he's learned from his mistakes. He's hard at it. He's a stubborn bull of a guy. And he's a huge human being, by the way. But he's he learned, I think he's learned the hard way. And what he's gonna do now is you're gonna see him do the thing people have been begging him to do, which is yeah, you throw pure gas, but we need you to be more of a pitcher. And I think this injury will cause him and, and has caused him to reflect on how to become more of a pitcher. And that's dangerous too for the rest of the league because here's a guy who can throw hard, but the, and I think you'll see more movement on his pitches because I think he realizes he needs more movement than velocity. And you know, I think I, that's where yeah. Hefner will come in, into play because spin rate, like he throws hard, but it, there have been many a times and many a game when you see him throw 99 and it's on a string. And I don't mm-hmm. care who you are. You could be a 17-year-old kid with a quick bat. You could take 99 deep. If yeah. it's straight. And and I think he's going to be, you, you're going to see more movement out of, out of, out of Syndergaard. Both That's actually a great point consumer. because we have seen that we've seen, you know, how are these guys turning around these fastballs? But you know what, if they know it's coming and they're geared up for it and it's straight as an arrow, you can turn it around, you know, oh, major yeah. leaguers, the, the batters are getting paid too. And they're going right. to, they're going to turn that thing around. So I think there is something to be said about that for sure. And I, I hope that, he becomes the kind of pitcher, and I talked about this a lot last week about Marcus Stroman. Even though Stroman is such a different kind of pitcher from DeGrom, I think Stroman is such a competitor. He looks at DeGrom, and he looks at him as somebody that he can, one, learn from, but oh, then two, tries to go out there and say, well, I got to do that now. Even though he's going to do it differently. Or even one-up him. Try. Yeah, or exactly. Even try to one-up him. And, and and what I love about if you, I follow his uh, Instagram. I love I love. I love I love Stro. I know he rubs people the wrong way, but he, he he's passionate about improving himself. You know, his dad his dad taught gave him these this set of rules and discipline, and he's a guy that's just always trying always trying to grow on and off the field. And and he's just like, how can I? He's he's all about improving himself. And admittedly, has posted on his Instagram about hung out with the ground today. I think I learned something new. <laughs> And people don't realize, like, you all think he's this arrogant jerk, but he's really, he, he's showing you how humble he is by saying, oh, no, I'm hanging out with Jake and picking his brain. I'm trying to see what he's doing. I don't have the arm or the size to do it because he's like 5'7". Yeah. He's a small guy. And he still hits, I think he maxed out last year one time at 94 or 95. And now, he's, you know, you, you'll see him in, in a couple games. He, you know, he'll get up to 93. But there's a difference when your fastball is 93 and it's moving. Mm-hmm. When or when it's hun- uh, nearly a hundred and it's on a line, yeah, you know, absolutely. there's a big difference. And I think you know, and and that's one of the things. Like I was a a monster power pitcher. You know, I'm a pretty big guy, six three, whatever. And I just threw really hard, but I I didn't have any idea where the ball was going most times. But I had a lot of good movement. So when my fastball would flatten out, man, it was like Christmas for batters. My yeah. dad, my dad, like I said, four eleven, never weighed over a hundred pounds in his life. One time. 
you know, he, I was out practicing with my buddies. We had like a little scrimmage. My dad wanted some at bats. Yes, this was the day I threw at him. And the main reason why I threw at my dad was because my dad came up in his first at bat and I was throwing hard and he slapped one over the, over the second baseman's head. He went the opposite way with it and it pissed me off because he hit it hard. And I was like, that little bastard, you don't get to do this. Because you know what it is? My dad had had like eight heart attacks at that point. He was a sick little man. <laughs> And he smacked the shit out of my fastball, which was way over 90 at the time. And I was just like, this little SOB. And he smiled. Then he had the nerve to come up and smile. Threw right at him. I don't care. But, I, and it's, but what I'm saying is it's like, it doesn't matter how hard you throw. And the harder you throw, guess what? If someone puts the bat on the, on the ball, they put the barrel of the bat on the ball, it's going somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we saw that evidence with uh, the, the Miami game with Jazz Chisholm. I mean, look, DeGrom is a guy, unlike Syndergaard, you know, his stuff seems to have movement no matter what. His crazy. stuff is plus, plus, plus stuff. And he he's throwing, uh, you know, 100 miles an hour from his arm angle. When he throws up in the zone, it's it's one of those pitches that seems like it's got, you know, up it's tilt ups, right. and it's rising. And you know what? But he, he beat Chisholm with two of them. And the third time Chisholm was like, I'm, I'm not going to get beat on a fastball if he throws me another one. Right. And DeGrom threw it. It wasn't even a bad pitch. It was up. Right. It was probably a little bit out of the strike zone, and he turned on it. And so, right. you know, and this is a guy who's got the stuff that's got movement that is nasty. But if a guy's ready for it, they will turn on it. And like you said, you don't have to – if a guy throws 100 miles an hour, you don't have to do much. You let the right. bat do the work. You just flip your wrist out there and let the oh, yeah. bat do the work. I mean, and, and, and what I used to – and what I love about that, and this is why I love the game of baseball, and I, and, and I forgot who, who coined the phrase, you know, the hardest thing to do in sports, I don't care what anybody says, is to hit a round ball with a with a round bat that's going nearly 100 miles an hour. It's just and, 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 the, and the things that a pitcher can do with a baseball is just ridiculous. So it's it's challenging in all these aspects. Uh, did you guys did you see when Granky recently threw that Ephus curveball? Yes, I did. Now, <laughs> I, did I love that. <laughs> I, I love, love the Ephus pitch. I love when these guys break it out. But here's the thing. He can still hit like 90, 91 on the gun. So if he follows that up with a 90 mile an hour fastball, that thing looks like 105. Yeah. So it's kind of like it, it, there's so many different things you can do with 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 being a pitcher. And I I just love that. I just think that cha- that 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 fight, that that argument, that battle that goes on between batter and pitcher is just one of the the. the most purest things you can see on a, on, a, on a field of battle or in sports. I totally agree with you there to the point that, you know, a lot of people who are casual sports fans will always hit you with the adage, especially if you love baseball, they'll say baseball's boring, right? I'm sure yeah. you've heard that your whole life. People tell you baseball's yeah. boring. And I, I don't think that baseball is boring. I actually think baseball is one of the most exciting sports that we have, but it's about nuance. If you don't mm-hmm. understand what's at stake. Now it's not to say that some of the games aren't absurdly long or there's not downtime. Of course there's, but every sport does. I mean, mm-hmm. I know they just did some thing about the NFL that like they took all the plays all season long from the NFL. NFL and it was like a 12 minute clip. You want to talk about downtime, you know what I mean? Like think about <laughs> yeah. how long football games are and oh, they were yeah. able to like bottle it up into like fit less than 15 minutes. But if you don't understand the nuance of baseball, that's when it becomes boring, especially when the games are really intense. And I remember mm-hmm. saying that to an ex-girlfriend of mine, cause she was like, well, you're so passionate about this. I want to be involved. I want to know. And so, you know, one day we sat down and I started telling her like what's going on between the pitcher and what's going on between the batter, the cat and mouse game. And she, she was like, wow, I get this now. And it was a year, you know, the Mets made it to the playoffs. I believe it was 15, uh, nice. 2015. And, you know, she was like, and now I'm so invested because every pitch in the playoffs means so much because the game turns like that. You and then you dumped her. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, and I did. I was like, now that you got it, now leave. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you teach all the other women. Get out of my house. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, but um, we, we're, we aren't together anymore, but it has nothing to do with baseball. But I was just, I, I love that she was able to, Uh, she, she had the want and desire to be like, well, wait, why is this, why is this exciting? You're telling me it's exciting, but why? And I think if you allow yourself to understand the nuance of baseball, you will understand, uh, you know, how exciting it can be. I just want to jump back into the comments real quick, because there's some really important ones. Uh, Jerry Lobert says, nice job, John Sapinaro. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, uh, Jason Bornstein saying John Sapinaro is the man. Great dude. So I just Those are actually two guys that I play softball with. They're really, really good. Now, how'd you players. go? Oh, wait a minute. How's the game on Saturday? Did you get my hit? Did you get a hit for me? 
I did. I did get a hit for you. I did, oh. and I and I went the and I went the other way to do it. I, I flicked nice. my wrist at it and went over the second nice. baseman's head. We did lose though to uh, Jason Borenstein's team. So, uh, but uh, we lost by one. That's a whole other thing. I'm and coming out of retirement. I'm coming out there. <laughs> Anytime, man, come out here. Uh, Keith Blacknick saying uh, some NYC marathoners finish faster than most Met games, <laughs> <laughs> and then That's and then throw it in baseball, there. Though. <laughs> Stop paying these guys off, Sap. Listen, you know what? I got to do what I got to do uh, to get the no to get the comments. But um, one 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 thing I wanted to touch on you you brought it up a minute ago about uh, we went off on the pitching tangent. You said if one of these guys gets hot and starts getting contagious, hitting gets contagious, uh, they could really snowball. One guy who was taking so much shit from Met fans that actually has been hot is Michael Conforto. Over the yep. last 12 games, he's hitting 320, 408 uh, on base, two home runs, six RBIs, and he's looked like a different guy. I remember watching last night, and I said out loud uh, two or three times, I was like, what a good take. He was not flailing, and it's easy because some of the other guys in the lineup are still flailing. They're still chasing those low and away pitches. They're still chasing the sliders in the dirt, and you could see Conforto just stand there and just spit on it and just watch it go by. If you watch what he did, started to do last season, I've always be- and I've always had this gut feeling about Conforto. I always felt coming out of college, uh, I always felt he could be a two ninety to three fifteen hitter with 30 home runs and 100 RBIs. I felt like that was his place. He had the body type for it, and he has the swing for it. Mm-hmm. He had one of the prettiest swings coming out of college. Yeah, He just absolutely. did. He, beautiful level swing with line drive power and pop. Just natural pop. He, you know, and he, ge- the genetics. You know, both his parents were serious athletes. It's in the genes. But he, he um, honestly, I just, I've always liked his swing. Uh, and don't forget, he had that shoulder injury that kind of slowed his progress. So I I just, I've seen it. And what I saw last year was him start to put it together. Like I don't have to hit home runs all the time. My job is to, is to drive runners in. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to change my approach to make sure that I'm always putting the ball in play with, you know, with, with some, you know, with solid barrel contact. And as long as he continues that man, that guy's going to hit 290 to 300 and he's going to drive in a bunch of runs. He's a, I think he's a hell of a hitter. I think so too. I mean, he was, he was the, the best, they said the most prepared college hitter, the most pro ready right. college hitter coming out of that draft. And in, and in 15, I mean, he came up so quick. He was a big part of our world series run. And, you know, he was such, uh, everybody talks about getting Cespedes, which was huge. And even, you know, your and Kelly Johnson was huge and uh, Addison Reed and Tyler Clippard, but you know, they brought up Conforto. They were aggressive, bringing up a guy who didn't have a lot of time in the minors, but everybody said was ready, and he proved that he was ready. And he he is a little too streaky sometimes for me, That's and true. I love Conforto as a player. But to your point, I just think that he shouldn't be streaky. You know, his swing is too good. He shouldn't be as streaky. Sometimes he reminds me more of Lucas Duda than he does a guy like, you know, McNeil or a, a Keith Hernandez, you know, somebody from the left side that's so consistent and so so sweet with their swing. Uh, he reminds me a little too much of Duda, and that, for me, is is the problem. The, my, <clears throat> I wouldn't put him in the Duda stratosphere uh, of, like, failure because I, I, I despise Duda. Me too. He was my least favorite player on the Mets. Him and Ruben Tejada, I thought, were oh, like yeah. the most useless players Absolutely. that I've ever seen. Totally agree. I hated it. <laughs> and then Collins would come out and is, well, I just got to get those two going. Shut up. Retire. I used to get so mad. But I, I will say this about Conforto. I think he's gonna. I think he's gonna be streaky. I think. I think baseball, the way the game is played today, due to analytics, and due to the adjustments based on analytics you will see guys who would have probably like in the eighties and nineties who would have consistently hit like three something and made more contact. I think you'll see them go through streaks more now because pitchers just have way more information now. And I, and I think you see, I I've seen in J I've cause I noticed the pitching and more than anything, but I, I've seen in game adjustments from a starting pitcher to a relief pitcher just, and I could just instantly pick up and I was like, Oh, so they picked up something via video and they shared that information to somebody in the bullpen. And it's just, it's just a different game now. It really is. And I think you, what happens is, is that pitchers are adjusting quicker and, and, and the game is adjusting quicker where I, and, and hitters should be able to adjust as quickly. But the thing is, you know, as a player, when you're on a hot streak, you kind of stick to what works, especially as a hitter. 
Yeah. And I, and I think that's where you see these streaks more in, in many players. I've, you know, uh, for all of like Mike Trout's greatness, if you look at his numbers over a full season, he, he has, he tends to have hot streaks. Mike, sadly, Mike Trout's hot streaks are like huge hot streaks. They're like supernova hot streaks. But, and I, and I think that's what I, that's one thing I started to notice in the last like 10 years due to this information age is that you're seeing like th their streak here, but man, when they're on a hot streak, it's, it's ridiculous. But now pitchers are able due to the same technology to adjust uh, far more quickly. And I think, um, cause baseball seems to, uh, I don't know. I don't like the direction of MLB as a whole, because I think they're really more worried about the offensive side of the game. And like, well, your, your buddy there keeps talking about the length of games. Uh, here's the thing. A better pitched game is, is a shorter game. Mm -hmm. You know, Absolutely. the games go fast and pitchers are more dominant, you know? So this whole thing where we're going to speed up the game by trying this thing or that thing, it's, it's it, you, by when they lowered the mound, the games extended, you started to see times of length of game go. And now they're talking about lowering the mound and pushing it back a foot and doing all these things. And it's just going to lengthen the game because yeah. scoring runs takes a lot of time. Yeah. I, I, I think baseball is in a weird spot because I think that they consistently look for love in all the wrong places. Absolutely. I think that there is stuff that you can do to make sure that they, I'm, I'm not a purist, but I am a, a real baseball fan. And so I think there's a lot of stuff that's not broken and they should continue. Baseball's got a, a, you know, obviously a ton of history and it's a game that relies so heavily on the numbers. And so that's why that history is so important, keeping that intact. But you know, it's funny to see these old guys who are in charge, the commissioner who's old, Joe Torrey, who's old, you know, and, and they they want to try these things that to me don't really make any sense. You know, you talk about putting a runner on second base in extra innings or, you know, only allowing, um, you know, three pitchers or uh, three batters right. for, for the relief pitcher. And in some cases, the seven inning double header, in some cases, you're not actually shortening the game because – you're already talking about a game that is inherently longer. If a game right. goes to extra innings, well, that game is going to be longer no matter what. And I get right. you might not want that game to go 18, 19, 20 innings, right. but putting a runner on second base, that does nothing to the length of a standard nine inning game. No. Having a shorter double header that only goes seven innings. Well, you've had a rain out. You've had a double header. Now that does nothing for your typical length of a nine inning game. And so I think that they, I think that their heart's in the right place, but I think that they look in the wrong places. And what oh, they're absolutely. doing is they're changing baseball fundamentally in a way that's bad for the game ultimately. Absolutely. And here's, I got a question for you. That, and, and this is because this was a hot topic between me and a buddy of mine, the seven inning, no hitter to me, it's a no, no. And I'll tell you why baseball changed the rules. Mm -hmm. You can't punish the pitcher for pitching seven innings of complete baseball of no hit ball and say, it's not, it's not an official no hitter. Didn't go nine innings. You made it. No, you've made it not nine innings. It's not the pitcher's fault. I agree think? with you completely. I, I, I totally do. It's it, they're almost talking out of both sides of their mouth. Cause they're like nine innings. Isn't representative of a full uh, seven innings. Isn't representative of a full baseball game. If you pitch a no hitter, it's gotta be nine. But for the purposes of like what the standings and everything mm -hmm. else, nine innings is a representative a uh, seven innings is representative. So they've made that rule. In that case, if you pitch a full game and allow no hits, it's a no hitter. I'm sorry. It doesn't right. matter if that game is, is, is seven innings nine innings 12 innings four innings you, right. whatever rule you've established you, you know you can't penalize madison bumgarner because to their point they're like well how would you know what would happen in two more innings well how would you know that he wouldn't continue to not allow right. hits you don't know right. predetermined outcomes you have no idea and right. so i i think that they've shot themselves in the foot when they start talking about these things it doesn't make any sense you know they're all over the place when they, they bring up these rules because there are a few ways i think that they can keep the integrity of the game while also shortening the game. And um, I've talked about this with a few other people and I want to run them by you. So one thing that they, they toyed around with that I think they should stick to, I think there should be a pitch clock. I think Absolutely. that it should be an enforceable thing because pitchers take too much time. When you see a guy, and it doesn't have to be DeGrom or Cole who are otherworldly, you see a guy like David Peterson who's having a good day. He gets the ball, he takes the sign, he throws the pitch. When you see stuff like that, the game moves so much quicker, mm -hmm. right? I think the other thing they need to do 
is enforce the batters staying in the batter's box. Long. Yes. Absolutely. Um, guys never used to step out and I understand people do it now. Look, you take an ugly swing on a ball that comes up and in, in your kitchen and you want to step out and readjust because it was nasty and you just got to stretch out fine. But you know what? Guys take pitches right down the middle and then they step out. Mm-hmm. What are you stepping out for? And then the last one, which I think is a little controversial, but I think would actually satisfy a lot of things is that I think they should allow the shift to continue but with certain restrictions. So I just think that they should say, look, you can shift guys around the infield however you want, but there's got to be two players on either side of second base. So, you know, if you got a a shortstop like Lindor, he only needs to be one step on the other side of second base. And if he's rangy and he can get there and make the play, fine. But a lot of times you've got guys, you know, they're, they're stacking infielders on one side it, it's it's not as simple as some of these guys who are like, ah, just go the other way. You've got a guy like DeGrom throwing easy. a – it's not that easy to do. And I think <laughs> if you just did those, you would have a more exciting, faster-moving baseball game. I think – I think – I think I, – I, I, I don't – I'm not a big proponent of the shift, but under those conditions, I, I could see how that works. Mm-hmm. Like, to me, like, my issue is I don't mind the shift, but when you have your third baseman near second and everybody else on the – you know, it's just weird. It's just to me, I'm like, eh, you know, uh, I just think it, it does a disservice to the game like, I I, 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 to a certain degree. You know, I think it, I think there should be parameters. You know, I, I think, yes, DeGrom, um, Lindor should be able to move over, but he's still got to be on the other side of, of, of second base, especially because he has so much range. And I, and I, I mean, you can't you can't account for range in every shortstop or every second baseman. But I, I think there, there there should definitely be where. Instead of a full shift, it's more of a lean, kind of like when a, a fat person gets on the car. You know? <laughs> I agree with you there, though. I think that's a big part of it. I think that, you know, because then you're still putting an emphasis on athleticism and defense, right. you know, because now you're saying, OK, well, my shortstop can't play directly behind second base. And right. so we need to have a guy that is rangy, that can get there. And, and few shortstops are Lindor in terms of mm-hmm. his athletic ability mm-hmm. in the field. But I'm just using him because it's a it's a Met show. And why not? Oh, talk absolutely. About it? But um you know, I, I think that those little tweaks would go such a long way because here's the other part of it. They want guys to come out of themselves so, so much to beat the shift. And yeah, look, if you need a base runner and it's a one nothing game or whatever, and you want to see a guy bunt down the third baseline because it's the ninth inning and try to beat the shift and just get on, I, that's, that's fair. But, you know, in the middle part of a game, the guy's not going to do it because if the outcome is he's going to hit the ball you know, 95 miles an hour to the second baseman who's playing short right field, right? or he's going to hit the ball 118 miles an hour and it's going to go over the right field fence. I still want him taking the chance and hitting the ball yeah. hard somewhere than trying yeah. to slap the ball the other way. I just yeah. don't think, I don't think it makes sense. I don't think you can compare it to like, oh, guys in the seventies used to do it because pitchers aren't throwing as hard as they were then. No, they weren't. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, what would be funny though, is I'd have every one of my heavy hitters on a team every day practicing bunts the opposite way mm-hmm. just to just to be prepared for it and also kind of to kind of be an asshole about it like get your <laughs> team get your team so good at doing it that they just do it all the time and people are just like well hush well hell we can't do this shift they're butting their way on it's kind of like at some point when do you when do they when is their logic in the game i mean it's kind of i i just think that some of the rule changes that that should happen and some of them that shouldn't happen it's 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 kind of a mess right now man freddy is just i don't think he's 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 the the leadership we need at the top of the league i just don't he i understand he's 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 he um wants to try new things and i, and I get it that's kind of wonderful but in in the in the long term I, I think if when you when you mess with like the things that make baseball baseball to a certain degree it's kind of like it's like it's like someone using vegan chocolate in your chocolate cake you know, like, mm, i don't want that yeah you know, you're nice you're like oh thanks for making me a cake and you're like nibble on it but then afterwards you're like you're in the car with your with your missus or, or your kids and you're like did you like that no nobody liked that nobody nobody enjoyed that you know. yeah I, 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 I agree with you on manfred i, I think that if for no other reason he just doesn't he doesn't have the pulse of the game and what the no. game needs. And I, I I've said this to other people too. And I know that you're a little bit older than I am, but I, I think that there's this, 
baseball in this sense is a weird microcosm for the country at large that we live in, in that <laughs> the boomer generation has been around for such a long time and has held on to, you know, businesses, their CEOs still, there's still seats in Congress, there's still mm-hmm. Supreme Court justices. And to break it down to what we're talking about now, there's still commissioners of baseball mm-hmm. and on, you know, uh, competition committees. It's like, when are the younger folks going to get an opportunity to have these jobs and make some of these decisions? People who are closer to having their pulse on what the younger folks actually want. The guy that I use as an example for this isn't even quote unquote young anymore. It's Theo Epstein. Theo Epstein is the perfect guy. He wants to be commissioner. He probably should be commissioner. I I think he'd do a great job. I think he'd do a great job and he's not even He's not even that young anymore. He was young when he had the job, but compared to the people who are making these decisions now, I think he's the perfect guy. And it's like, eventually he'll get his opportunity. And then uh, there are other people that are are never going to get a seat at the table. And I think that that's why we hamstring ourselves because we're sitting here and we're not letting people who actually should be in the room, making some of the decisions, or at least having a say, we're not letting them in the room. I think I think what you're going to see I, and, and what I kind of do like about what Cohen has done with the Mets is you, you got the old head. You got Sandy, but Sandy was a part of innovation with, with the Oakland A's. So mm-hmm. he gets it. He has an idea on, uh, on it. I mean, he's got that Marine discipline. But then, you know, the, the Mets front office is pretty young outside mm-hmm. of Sandy. And I think that's what you'll see more in baseball. And I think that's what work will work. You know, you'll you'll get this like aged figurehead who's got you know that his button on the old days and and understands the modern game and then you got these younger guys that are like all right pop pop listen that's the way you guys did it <laughs> but you know here's some information and and what i like about sandy I, i'm not a big sandy fan i've never been but what i do like about him is his openness to new information you know it's it's kind of like when you're trying to tell grandpa don't listen to that crappy angry radio show and he's like, no, I got to listen because I've got to hate something. <laughs> you know, Sandy doesn't Sandy's kind of like, you know, he, he floats between like, I got to no, nah, I don't want to hate. I'd rather read this book and gain some information. So it's it, I think it's it's kind of like it's changing because, you know, the baby boomers are aging out. And um, and, I, and I think you'll see those adjustments. But um, I have so much stuff on my desk. I keep looking to grab something. It's odd. <laughs> It's like I'm having I'm, I'm having Tourette's or like a, a shake. Uh, but uh, so what you're seeing is you will see that transition. And I, and I like that you brought Theo Epstein up because I think he'd make a hell of a commissioner. And I think that's his goal because he's done everything else and he's yeah. done everything else. Eh, OK, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's been he's been yeah. OK, successful. He's, he's like, you know, he's fine. He's fine. But I think you do. I think you need a guy who who definitely innovated the game. And was a part of that innovation. I would like to see him, and actually Billy Bean. Mm-hmm. You know, I I that I think they'd make a hell of a combination at the top of the league, because I, then I think you could see them make some smart decisions and 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 basically leave the game that we love alone, but make the adjustments we need to modernize it. And that's what's so strange to me, because the people that are making the decisions on the game are these older guys and they're the ones that are trying things that are fundamentally altering the game. It's almost like you would expect somebody who's way younger to be like, the game's too long, make them seven innings. And then like old people be like, Oh my God, wait, what? Baseball's been this way for 200 years. Why are you changing it now? And it's, it's, I have an answer for you. What happened? I have an answer for you. And, 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 And it's just a truthful answer. It's mathematics, brother. It's business. Yeah. For these older guys, it's about the business of baseball. Yeah. You know, we we fans are, who are like real fans, you know, we love the game. This These guys that you see now, a lot of the older guys, they, they're interested in the business of baseball because it's a business that generates billions. Right. Sadly, I think that's, that's when you come into a, a big issue here because I think that part of the game is stealing from the passion and the power of the game because this is a game that has been with our nation for for 200 years you know just almost 200 years and it's just crazy like it reflects the country and i think like if you get guys like theo in there and billy you'll see things that baseball is not doing which they should do baseball when i was growing up it was part of the inner city the game you got to bring the game back to not just small towns and places where they're getting these baseball academies you got to bring it to the local high schools and, and major cities again You've got to make it a game that's more diversified and and spread out, not just by having camps in in the Dominican Republic where you're feeding kids, you know, 
at, at the age of nine and, and trying to make the next, you know, Pedro Martinez or whatever. It, I just think they in, in America alone, it, it lost a lot of its its power because it's it's no longer a game that kids in the inner city can play. You know, and I just think mm-hmm. that MLB needs to get involved on that level. And I and I think you'll see those changes. I, I really see that there will be a youth movement in the in the people, the power brokers of the game sooner than later, because it's such a great game. You don't want to lose it. It's such a money maker. They don't want to lose it. <laughs> That's really well put, man. I'm going to, I'm going to leave that right there. Cause that was, that was really fantastically done. Um, we've got about five minutes left. So I want to jump back into the Mets specifically. Um, we were supposed to do this show on, on Friday. We had to move some yeah. things around. If we would have done this on Friday, it would have been a much different conversation because <laughs> it would have been, you know, after those two embarrassing losses to Boston leading into the Philly series. And again, we talked about at the beginning, the Philly series had its ups and downs, but when we look back, they've won two of three, from the right. Phillies, they got out of there at 500, and now we have a series to look forward to here. Uh, four games against the Cardinals. The Cardinals are, I think, a little bit better than people maybe expected. You know, yeah. I know they got Arenado. They're four games over mm-hmm. 500. So, how much of what you've seen over the last two days, where the Mets got wins, how much can you take into this series in in St. Louis? I mean, what do you think? Do you think they are starting to turn a corner offensively, or do you think it was some bad Phillies pitching because their bullpen has been bad for the last couple of years? All right, the bullpen has been bad, but I mean, I mean, Wheeler put up a hell of a fight the other day. You know, I mean, the, the Phillies aren't that bad, and and mm-hmm. and what you saw was Donnie Stevens really get them ready <laughs> to approach the game differently. I think what you're seeing now is that this team is starting to gel. They, they, due to what you mentioned earlier, you know, they, they've had an erratic beginning to the season due to weather and, and COVID. So they're getting more consistent games under their belt and they're starting to gel. I think um, the St. Louis series will, will, will be uh, something that will, they'll take with them for a while. And I think they're going to, I actually think they're going to win this series. I think it'll be hard for it. I think St. Louis is a much better team than people expected them to be. Uh, they have heart, and people forget that you know there have been some really crappy baseball teams that have won championships with heart. So I, I think they have fire, they have heart, and they're they're a team that they they St. Louis has a has a, t- a tight knit team, and I think that's why you'll see them win some ball games that they shouldn't. And I think mm-hmm. they're a good test for the Mets right now. And I think as long as the Mets keep on this like happy, like focused on Donnie Stevenson's work mentality, and they they let their pitchers do what they're doing. And they have fun playing the game and they start being a little more aggressive in, in certain counts. This is a team that's getting ready to launch. I'm telling you, June 15th, if the, <laughs> I, I, as of June 15th, I, I'm putting this warning out there for all the Yankee fans that are going to be bitter. And, and, and trust me, I love baseball history, so I, I respect the Yankees and the Yankee fans. But I'm going to tell you this, from June 15th on, people are going to look back at the St. Louis series and be like, oh, yeah, that was a sign. Okay. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to jot that down because I think uh, if you'll do it, I think right around June 15th, maybe not if, if, if if schedules don't work out, but I think, I think you might want to come back on that day. We can talk about it. Even if I'm wrong, here's the thing. I like being wrong. (laughs) I have four kids. I've been wrong. (laughs) Listen, man, I know you you're 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 a you're a tough guy and you're a face of the music kind of guy. So I yeah. know that you would come on either way. Oh, yeah. So let's let's jot that date down and let's Absolutely. look at that. I I actually think that you're you're on to something too because you know, look, they're, they're facing uh, a, a guy who ripped our hearts out several years ago, Adam Wainwright tonight, but he's not the same pitcher that he's no. been. You know, I, I think the Mets uh, bats will line up well against him. It's a matter of what Lucchese can bring to the table. He yeah. hasn't been great. Um, I think they said, oh, it's not a bullpen game. We're bringing up a starter, but Lucchese's out there. It's going to be a bullpen game. I mean, he's not going to go through the lineup. Do they go time. with a starter? Do they go with a, a starter before they begin Lucchese? Oh, a, uh, an opener? An opener. Um, go I don't opener? think that they're planning on doing that. I think that he will. He's listed right now on the official lineup sheet as the starter. So I think they're going to go with him first. And yeah. then if anything, maybe pull him early or piggyback him in Gesellman or him in mm-hmm. um, uh, Reed Foley, somebody like that. But I think they're going to let Lucchese start the game. Uh, but then after that, we've got DeGrom tomorrow then Stroman and then uh, Walker. So, you know, things do line up. I think you have to either steal this game or uh, the, the Walker game at the, at the back end is tricky because they're going against uh, John Flattery, who's great. And Mm -hmm. so, but I think if you steal either this game or that one, you know, the momentum swings way in your favor because they don't face Carlos Martinez and you've got DeGrom and Stroman going in the middle. So I think that it's all on that. 
I just want to bring up one more point that mm-hmm. we forgot to bring up. Don't forget Lugo is coming back. Yes. Soon, hopefully. <laughs> Lugo will be back soon. So you're getting three three very high quality pitchers coming back to this team. I See you guys June 15th. That's all I, I can say. Yeah, I completely agree. And right around June 15th is when they expect Syndergaard back too. So I think by the time you join us again, we're going to have Carrasco. We're going to have Syndergaard. We're going to have Lugo, yep. barring any setbacks. So, you know, I think you, you really might be on to something. Um, Mark, this this was absolutely fantastic. It was great conversation. And anytime you and I talk, it's always it's a oh, blast. Oh, man, I, I, I run into you on the subway and it's a thrill. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, before I let you get out of here, uh, do you have anything? I know it's a crazy time to, to plug stuff because some things are open, some things aren't. But do you have anything you want to plug, even if it's just you know what, guys? Uh, follow me on Twitter at Mark A Ramirez. I'm 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 writing a lot of tech uh, like computer journalism stuff and and like tech stuff that I've been doing. I get to throw a lot of comedy in my tech stuff, and I and I have uh, a special thing that I'm working on with MLB actually. Through the with the tech world, so it's going to be something fun for all my baseball fans. And as far as comedy goes, guys, I have something special coming for you guys at the end of the summer. So don't worry about it. I got a bunch of new projects coming. All right, so you heard it there. Follow him on uh, on Twitter. Follow him on Instagram. I'll throw the handles. I'll throw your handles in the comments so people Thanks can lot, find man. you uh, once we we stop going live. But uh, Mark, thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna wrap this thing up, and I will talk to you on or about June fifteenth <laughs> for another episode of this. We'll talk before. Take but care, that is, guys. That is uh, Mark Anthony Ramirez. Great comic, uh, great dude, uh, super fun. We always have a blast. Um, this has been Catching Feelings. I'm John Sapinaro, the host. We were on the Queens Baseball Convention Network. We were on my uh, channel as well. So wherever you watched it, thanks for keeping the comments flooding in, especially the ones that made me look, you know, really good. Like John Sapinaro is the man, great dude. Um, I appreciate that stuff. And I appreciate my guest, Mark Anthony Ramirez. We will see you guys next week. I've got another amazing guest lined up. I don't want to let it out of the bag quite yet, but we'll be live next Monday as well on my channel, on the Queens Baseball Convention Network, all the places that you used to see in this show. We're coming right back. Ladies and gentlemen, until then, let's.